we're going to take a fresh look at the parable of the prodigal son. But my goal this morning is to highlight the great love of God the Father. This heartfelt story made up by the Lord Jesus Christ paints a perfect picture of God, the Father's great love for sinners, listen, who are willing to humble themselves, who are willing to acknowledge who they are and how much they need God's forgiveness, God's salvation, and God's restoration. And so really that is the picture that Jesus paints with this parable of the prodigal son. It is a picture of man's fallenness and God's great love towards those who have turned their backs on him. We serve a mighty God and an extremely loving God. This tale of two sons really points out the three different kinds of people in Jesus' day and in our day. We have the reckless, the repentant, and the religious in the negative sense. The younger son represents those who are totally worldly, totally reckless, and are living in sin, those who are lost and gone and want nothing to do with church, nothing to do with God, nothing to do with religion, none of that for them. And the older son represents the self-righteous and religious sinner. The father in this parable, or in this story that the Lord Jesus Christ created, represents God the Father. So the younger son represents the reckless sinner. The older son represents the self-righteous religious. And the man in the story, the father in the story, represents Jesus himself and God the Father. Jesus told this parable of the lost son in connection to the Pharisees' complaints found in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. So turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. I love how masterfully the Lord Jesus answers the Pharisees' question with the story he makes up on the spot and puts everybody exactly where they're supposed to be in the story. It is really magnificent if you pay attention to Jesus' masterful way of ministering to the lost. Starting there in verse 1, it says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Uh, By the way, again, these represent the younger son in the parable of the prodigal son, tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors were known as some of the worst of the sinners because they would take advantage of uh, God's people. They would tax more than they should. They would rip people off. They worked for Rome and not Yahweh in the sense that they loved money more than God and more than God's people. So these were some wretched men. But we know in Scripture that God even has mercy on the tax collector. There are two very popular tax collectors in the New Testament, the first one being Matthew, the second one being Zacchaeus. So God has mercy on tax collectors. God has mercy on Pharisees. You have Nicodemus. You have Paul the Apostle. So these tax collectors and sinners represent the younger son in this prodigal story we're about to read in a moment. Then it goes on to say, And the Pharisees and scribes complained. Now, these are the ones that represent the older son in the prodigal son story, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. This man, again, represents the Lord Jesus Christ and his father. As you know, the Lord receives, as we'll read in a moment, his lost and dead son. One that the Pharisees would reject, Jesus receives. And so basically, The main reason why the Pharisees hated the Lord Jesus Christ was because Jesus loved sinners. Jesus loved sinners who would humble themselves, repent, and put their trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus loves when humanity humbles themselves. He saves their souls, makes them his children, and brings them to heaven. But the Pharisees, as you know, They were hard-hearted. They will not and would not bend. After their complaints against Jesus, uh, Jesus gives three parables that all point to the same thing. For example, you have the parable of the lost sheep. The shepherd leaves the 99 
That points to the self-righteous Pharisees who, quote unquote, need no repentance and salvation. And he goes after that lost one, right? And when he finds them, he puts them over his neck and he calls his friends to rejoice with him, to party over one lost sheep that has been found. And then he gives the story of the woman who had 10 coins and lost one coin. She looks everywhere to find it. She finally finds it. Then she calls her comadres. She calls her best friends down the street and rejoices over that lost coin, right? And then we, of course, have the story of the prodigal son. So the Lord shared three stories that was supposed to put the Pharisees in their place to show the great love of God over one lost sinner and how far he would go to find that one lost sheep, coin, and son. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. We're going to go ahead and read Luke chapter 15, verses 11 and 12. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 and 12. Your subtitle may read, The Prodigal of the Lost Son. The Lord now is going to tell the story. Then he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So the father divided to them his livelihood. In the ancient Middle East world, it would be a total disrespect for a son to ask for their inheritance before their father dies. It's the equivalence of telling his father, I wish you were dead. This way I can get my portion of your estate and wealth. That's basically what he was doing. When he told his dad, please give me my portion, it was as though it were even worse than a slap in the face. He had no love for the father, no respect towards the father. And all of the great blessings and provisions and benefits of the father. Nietzsche who was a 19th century German philosopher, was the first one to declare God is dead. And the reality is that many unbelievers treat God today as though God were dead. By totally disregarding his authority, by totally disregarding his infinite worth, by totally disregarding the worship he deserves. And many wish that God were dead even today. Of course, they won't say it. Some are bold enough or foolish enough to say it, but even today, many wish that God was dead. Why? So that they would not have to face the consequences of their sinful lifestyle like the younger son here. And many in the world today wish that God did not exist so they can act however they want, speak and think however they want. In those times, the younger son would get one-third of the father's estate. The oldest son would receive two-thirds of the father's estate. And the reason why was because the older son in those days was considered to be somewhat of a spiritual leader. He was to be the most responsible one in the family, take care of the father's estate, maybe even take care of his mother if the father passes. And so he's given more. But in the spiritual aspect, we see this. The Pharisees, the reason why Jesus was saying you got more than the tax collectors and sinners is because the Pharisees had access to the word of God. The Pharisees had access to the Old Testament scriptures. Tax collectors and sinners, not so much. They would even stay away from the church house. But the Pharisees were always there every Sabbath. And so in one sense, in one sense, God gave the Pharisees more of the wealth, if you will, because they were given the Bible. And so spiritually speaking, they got two thirds. They got two thirds. And as you know, the Pharisees squandered the word of God just as bad as a younger son. Tax collectors and sinners squandered what they had from the Lord, the little they knew of God. And it goes on to say here, so he, that is the father, divided to them his livelihood. 
Now, what you need to understand is that this too would come as a shock to the Pharisees as they're hearing this story. Why? Because at this point, they all knew that any dad worth his salt would have smacked this boy silly. <laughs> it's the most disrespectful thing that a child could do to their parent in the Middle East in the ancient times to say, give me the money before you die. The Pharisees were thinking, how is it that the father actually did what the son asked, which was so extremely disrespectful? And so they're blown away by the whole story, just how bad this younger son is and how the father would give him his portion of the wealth before his death. They were waiting for Jesus to say, and when the son asked for his money, the dad, he pulled back the hand and he whacked that boy. He said, don't you ever disrespect me again. It's not what he did. He gave him what he was asking for. Again, the young son deserved a slap, but instead he got riches. He got his father's riches. But this too is a picture of God's goodness and letting the sinner do what he wants with his life, isn't it? We saw that in the garden. God created a man with the free will. He says, okay, you can take the many blessings I've given you and you can squander them if you want. You can take the precious time I've given you. You can take the breath I've given you. You can take the energy, the youth, old age, the wisdom, the knowledge, all of the blessings that we have, like the sun and the rain and friends and family and jobs and paychecks. You can take all of that and you can use it however you want to use it, God says to the sinner. Only one day they will have to stand before God and give an account for the freedom that God gave them. And so then, God allows sinners to take the great blessings of God and to do whatever they want with them. But one day they will stand before God and give an account. Let us read now verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. This reckless boy wasted no time in selling his portion of his father's wealth. He had to liquidate what his father gave him. And most likely, he sold it in a discount price in order to get this stuff uh, into cash as soon as possible. He turned all of his possessions, such as lands and buildings and animals and whatever it was that the father had given him, he had to sell all of that and turn it into money. So he left his father's house with a great wad of cash. We can say that he left his father's house with a suitcase full of money, stacks of hundreds, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of property was sold immediately so that way he can waste it, that way he can splurge over the hills and far away maybe in Vegas where he can sin freely and happily without having to hear anything from his father and his family and his friends. He wanted to sin out of sight and out of mind. Verse 30 tells us that this wild child used his dad's money to sleep with prostitutes. He used the blessings that God gave him to sin in the most horrendous ways. Jesus points to the worst of the worst sinners in order to contrast that sinner's wildness, recklessness, godlessness with God the Father's love and his willingness to fully forgive and restore the repentant wayward sinner. And so God did this on purpose. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and telling them, look, I'm going to create the worst character that you can imagine, and I'm going to show you how God the Father will save the worst character imaginable. In fact, the Apostle Paul says that he was the chief of sinners. And he says that God saved me to be an example to you all, that if he can save me, the chief of sinner, the king of sinners, he can save any sinner. Paul the Apostle understood that. And that's why he told Timothy, hey, Timothy, know one thing. 
God came to save sinners. Of who I am chief, he said. And so we see that same heart in the prodigal son's story. This boy was all about the lust of the flesh, obviously, sleeping with prostitutes, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. The pride of life um, points to people trusting in their wealth, trusting in their success, flossing what they drive, what they wear, what they look like, and that is the pride of life. And this man, this young man, was probably a teenager, by the way, (laughs) lived this way. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He says, give me my inheritance now as though you were dead, and let me take this stuff and squander it. And his soul was in great danger. And it sounds like many modern day college students and kids today, doesn't it? They leave their home so that way they can party hard in the name of education with their parents' hard-earned money. (laughs) We see the story of the prodigal son every day. Everywhere we look, any unsaved is taking the blessings of God the Father and squandering their lives with it. But again, we are the prodigal son in this story. Anytime you read about a bad guy in the story, it was you and I before God's grace came and rescued us. You're never the good guy. We're always the bad guy. Until God rescues us, restores us, and calls us sons and daughters. And the only goodness then is the goodness of Christ working in and through our lives. We all ran from God. We all wasted much of his blessings. I know I have, especially in my younger years. And there may be some here today who are still doing life as though God were dead and unimportant. My plea to you this afternoon would be turn to God. Do it now and the Lord will restore you. Let us read verse 14. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land And he began to be in want. The fun was over. The severe famine came to make things unbearably worse. This was the worst case scenario. He wasn't just having a bad day. The whole country was having a bad day. (laughs) No food, meaning no rain, no crops, no cereal in the morning. People were starving. And when you read of starvation and famine in the Old Testament, people revert to eating anything, even their children. So this famine was grotesque. It was done. People had lost their minds. No one had food. People were killing each other. There was violence across the land. He didn't know where to go. It was over. The party was over. He ran out of money and his friends ran out on him. Soon after, he was now alone, literally starving, couldn't find food anywhere, clinging to anyone who would give him a piece of bread, but he found none. He became a beggar. He was a rich man in the beginning. He ended up as an absolute lost, filthy, hopeless, hungry beggar. The end of his rope. No more rope. It's free falling. This is the point where all sin leads us to. Lost, empty, alone, hopeless, embarrassed, and desperate. This is the story of everyone who rejects God the Father. They will all end up like this. And if not in this life, most definitely in the life to come. Let us read verse 15 and 16. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. After hitting rock bottom, he was penniless. Not a penny to his name. He was friendless. 
He was familyless. He was alone and most likely experiencing physical pain due to STDs as he was sleeping with prostitutes. This wild child didn't run to his father first. He tried to find a way to help himself. You would think that at this point he would run back to his father's house. It's over. No more money. There's a famine. There's no food. I have no friends. I'm all alone. I'm going to look to God now. No, he looks to another man for a job. I'll pick myself up. I'll do the worst job if I have to, but I will pick myself up. I'll work for food. I'll bring me back to the place where I was before. I'll make this happen. I could do this. But it doesn't happen, as you know. He believed the lie that many believe in our culture today, and that is God only helps those who help themselves. That is a lie. God helps those who know they can help themselves. That's the truth. So he got a job as a swine feeder. We're talking about a young man who was extremely rich, most likely a part of a very popular family, and now he's feeding pigs. And again, many do this today. Instead of running to God, what do people do? They run to alcohol. They run to drugs. They run to a psychiatrist. They run to a new spouse. They run to a best friend who gives them terrible counsel. They run to whatever it is that they think can help them. It's not going to help you. That's not going to help you. That is only going to make matters worse. You run from God and your life gets worse. Why? Because only God can heal the broken soul. Only God has the power to make you new and satisfied deep in your heart. Nothing else, my dear friends. Nothing else will. Oh, maybe if I get a new girlfriend, maybe that'll help me out. Maybe I need a new job. Maybe I need a better car. Maybe that'll pick me up. It's not. It's not. Only God can pick you up. Didn't we see that with Peter as he walked on water, started seeking? He said, Lord, help me. God said, perfect. Get up here, Peter. It's what God does in this story with the prodigal son. And it's what God will do for you if you want to. But if you want to enjoy those pig pods, your stomach can't even handle them. Human stomachs cannot digest the pods that pigs eat. It's not going to nourish you. Nothing in this world, nothing you put before God will nourish you. It will make you spiritually malnourished. (laughs) Only God, only God can nourish us. Not only did he end up in the pig's pen, which were considered unclean animals by the Jews in the Old Testament, as you know, they could not eat pig's meat, let alone be around pigs. They were completely unclean. They were the worst of the worst animals. He himself became a pig as he was eating pig's food. He was in the pig pen fighting with pigs for food. Like, give me that trash. And that's what people do in this world. They fight each other for trash. Pigs fighting with pigs for pig's food. I did that before Christ. And if you're not in Christ, you're doing that today. Never satisfied. Never filled. This world will turn you into a pig or a dog. As the Bible says, we are called to be sons and daughters of God, humbling ourselves, recognizing that no one can satisfy us but our creator. That's the point of this existence. Get out of the pig pen if you're in it and run to your heavenly father and eat from his table. A banquet to your fool. This part would have horrified the Pharisees. Wait a minute, are you saying this young man, after doing everything he did, ended up in a pig's pen? (laughs) The story's just getting worse. That's what they're thinking. There's no remedy for this guy. And still no one gave him anything, the Bible says. In reality, if we run to anything or anyone instead of God to fill our souls, to satisfy us from the inside out, we will end up with nothing, nothing that can truly restore us and restore our broken souls. And listen, heal our guilty, unsatisfied conscience. 
restless conscience. Nothing else can do that for you. No one else can do that for you but the Lord. Let us read verse 17 and 19. And when he came to himself, thank God, <laughs> we pray that everybody would come to their senses. He said, how many of my father's hired servants, speaking of a rich man who had employees, have bread enough and to spare? He's like, man, the servants that used to work for me eat better than I do. And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. That's what it means to come to your senses. You recognize that you are in sin and you need a savior. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He recognizes unworthiness, something the Pharisees would never admit, would never admit. Even now, as I'm secure in Christ, knowing that I have eternal life, even now I feel my unworthiness. But who makes me worthy? The Lord Jesus' grace. People who don't sense their unworthiness are dead in sin. It says here, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he's preparing this speech, right? Jesus says when he came to himself, in other words, he recognized his need for the father. The friends that abandoned him didn't get him to that point. The money that he lost didn't get him to that point. The prostitutes that gave him STDs didn't get him to that point. The pods, the pig pen, the pigs, the man who didn't give him a job. <laughs> Dude, that wasn't a job. But collectively, eventually he said, what in the world am I doing here? When there is a God in heaven who can restore me, who can provide for me and love me. That's the thing. What am I doing in this slop? When I could be living in the arms of my heavenly father. He recognizes his need for the father. At this point, he is now lost enough. He is empty enough. He is hungry enough. He is desperate enough for salvation. He's ready for salvation. He's a prime candidate now. He's done. He's done. Has nothing, has no one. He's done. God says, perfect. That's when I'll save you. Only God has the bread of life, as you know, that fills the soul. That is truth that saves, strengthens, and gives eternal life. That pig's food would just make him vomit over and over and over again. He saw himself in the right light this time as a sinner in need of a savior. He was now ready to repent. Do you know that many people don't come to Christ, even those who come to church faithfully right away, because they are not empty enough? They're filled with themselves filled with their things, filled with their pride, filled with their worries, filled with their porn, filled with their drugs, filled with their alcohol, filled with the things of this world that doesn't fill us truly. Not ready. Not ready. They're not empty enough. They don't sense their desperation for God's salvation. They're not ready yet. And that's why many people don't come to Jesus right away. And I've told you this many times. There are many people who think they have Jesus and actually find out they actually come to Jesus 20 years after they have been in the church. A lot of people actually get saved later than they thought they did. That's a reality. They'll tell you they got saved in the beginning, but many have not been saved in the beginning. They're still dead in sin. They're still full of self, full of the world. And they're not alive just yet. But you keep on hearing the word. And you will know that you are born again. If you pay close attention to all the people that were around Jesus getting saved, they were all desperate. Every single one of them, whether they were missing an arm, they were covered in leprosy, they had an issue of blood, they had demons inside of them, they were outcast of society. They drew 
near to Jesus, and they heard him. Pharisees, not so much. Self-righteous, not so much. Let us read here verses 20 and 21. And he arose and came to his father. So the first thing that needs to happen is they need to come to their senses. Their conscience needs to be pricked by the law of God, showing them that they are sinners in need of the Savior. They need to recognize that they are poor, broken, hungry, spiritually speaking. They need to be ready to come to the Father and confess their sins and turn from it, knowing that they are unworthy and they are to come. Come to Him. Don't just know you need Jesus. Run to Him until He's inside of you. Because you don't want to get close to Jesus and not get in. You don't want to see that you, you're hungry and empty and lost and dead and yet not come to Jesus for regeneration, for a brand new heart, for the born again experience. And so we see the pattern there. Then it goes on to say, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. And he still wanted to say, I want to be your servant now. But the father stopped him. Father already knew at that point, my son is fully repentant. The father stopped him before he could finish. And we'll look at that in a moment. It says he arose and came to the father. Turn your Bibles to Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28 to verse 30. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. It's the greatest invitation you will ever have. Come to me directly to Jesus. Come to Jesus by faith. You yourself come to him if you have not yet. And not only do we come to Jesus for salvation, as you know, we come to Jesus for sanctification and for relational growth and for answered prayers. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will do what? I will give you rest. And that's what the young son found in his father's house. He found rest. He's home now. There's actually food on the table, a bed made for him, a room. He gets everything back, my dear friends. And we'll see that in a moment because I'm going ahead of myself. But anyway, 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Not like that slave driver that he found to make him feed pigs and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what did the father do? The father came to him and he gave him a bear hug. He saw him from afar. That points to the fact that the father was anticipating his son's return. I wouldn't doubt that the father would walk out into the road and look far away. Maybe he didn't have the best of sight, but he knows the shape of his son. And he's looking out there. Is my son coming today? The calf was ready. He was ready to celebrate his son's return. God is ready to celebrate any sinner who would come to him in repentance and faith. And so then the father, he's looking and he's seeing maybe is today the day that I will receive my son again. And the Bible says that he kisses him. And in the Greek, it points to him kissing him over and over and over again. Listen to me. This is how the father felt in the story. Picture this. It's as though one of us or someone we know had a child in the grave. And that kid raises from the grave in front of your face. How would you react? You would tackle that kid and kiss him to death again, wouldn't you? That's the way the father felt. His son was dead and is alive again. And he received him as such. As though one will receive their own child from the grave. That kind of love. That kind of excitement. That kind of Deep affection. I got my son back. I got my son back. The Bible says that the father ran. In the ancient Middle East, it is inappropriate for a father to run. 
It's seen as childish, immature, kiddish. It is seen as undignified, unrespectable for a patriarch, the man of the house, to pick up his robe and run. God runs to the one who comes to him. That's the picture of the Father's great love. Let us read verse 22 to 24. But the Father, I love that part. But the Father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Listen to me. I want you to know he had no sandals. Do you want to know why? Because during famine, people eat leather before they eat their animals and before they eat their children, depending on the severity of the famine. He had no sandals because he ate them. Research famines and the effects of famines. In verse 23, he says, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. I would just have you know that the fatted calf is a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ because the animal dies in the son's place. That son, according to Jewish law, should have been stoned to death. But guess what happens? A calf ready for food and God Nesada dies in his place instead. That's the picture of Jesus on the cross for us. Bring the fatted calf here and we'll kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 says that we were dead in trespasses and sin, but God saved us. God has saved us. And so he says, bring out the best robe. This is spiritually speaking to the righteousness God clothes the sinner with. He clothes them, positionally speaking, with the same righteousness Christ has. And God the Father sees the sinner now as he sees his own dear son. He clothes him, covers him. And not only that, my dear friends, but he goes further and he gives them a ring. This is the family ring. These rings held the signet. It was the father's signature. What does that mean? God restored authority to his long lost, dead, wasteful, prodigal son. He is now entrusting him with the rest of his estate. You jacked up, son. (laughs) And you squandered one third of my hard earned money. But I love you so much. We're going to start this thing over what he does to us and so then gives him a robe gives him a ring because at this point again he is clothed with stinky rags possibly almost naked wouldn't doubt it and the father must dismount pigs beastal and prostitutes but did that stop him from bear hugging him Kissing him over and over and over again. No, because God will not reject any sinner, even the worst of sinners, if they truly come to him. Doesn't matter what they've done. Jesus tried to paint the worst. Says he was dead. I would have you know that in that culture, even today in the Middle East, especially in Islam, If you change religions, beliefs, they will disown you. The more radical Muslims, they will disown their own kids. And they will tell them, you are as dead to me from now on. People experience what we're hearing here today. And in those days, what they would do is they would actually hold a funeral service as though the son had died. So that everyone would know what has really happened with this prodigal son. He is as good as dead. The way the son saw the father, the father saw the son dead. And so when it says he was dead, they had ceremonies for that. 
so everybody would know this kid has decided to leave the family. He is done. He's no longer a son. Let us read verse 25 to 32. Now this older son was in the field. All right, the younger son came from a faraway country, a Gentile country, where there was nothing but perversion and debaucherous living. The older son was in the field. He's doing his work, serving his dad. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. The older son's out in the field. He realizes his dad hired a Christian DJ. <laughs> Here's the music bumping. <laughs> What's going on over there? I had no idea there was going to be an impromptu party. <laughs> Most of the time, my dad would tell me there's a party happening. He hears there's a party going on. And in verse 6, so he called one of the servants and asked what these things mean. And so he inquires. He wants to know what's going on. Parties don't just happen instantly. Unless you're just a wild guy, you know. 27, and he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. In other words, this should have been the greatest news the older brother has ever heard. My younger brother is home. He should have ran. He should have ran to the party. He should have tackled his brother with love. Didn't happen. He hesitated. Let's read that. Verse 28. But he was angry like the Pharisees. Why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? Complaining about Jesus' love. Complaining about the Father's love for sinners. He was angry and would not go in. I am not joining that party. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Listen to me closely. Most of us can say, yeah, you know, I was that younger son. But there are some who are the older brother. They do not rejoice over the saved souls of men. They do not care if people get saved or not. They really don't even ponder on the Father's love and what He did on the cross for sinners. There are many Christians who are like the older brother. No evangelism. No rejoicing. It's not a part of their lives. They, they can care less. They'll tell you they care because it's the Christian thing to do. But in their hearts and from day to day, you may not see any of that. Be careful that you would not be the older brother. It says there, but he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Already the father showing his love. He came out to look for him too. <laughs> At this point, he was lost in his anger. The older son was lost too. Only he was still in the house. He goes to him. Come on in. Verse 29, so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed against your commandment at any time which is the way the Pharisees felt. They felt like they were above the law, but yet they were sinners through and through, lawbreakers. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends, making it all about himself, all about himself. His brother came back from the dead just about, and all he could think about is himself. How absurd is this story? Everyone in the story has lost their mind. The younger brother, the dad, and the older son. By the way, the dad so lovingly and respectfully treated both of his sons who hated him. I'm speaking of the older son. He hated his love. He hated his compassion. He didn't have the same affections as the father did. He was in the father's house, but he didn't have the father's heart. And many are in the father's house, but don't have the father's heart. Let's be careful with that. Verse 30, he says, and he starts to accuse his brother. But as soon as this son of yours came, not as soon as my little brother, <laughs> the one that I used to play tag with, the one that used to work on the field with me, the one who came out of the same womb and ate on the same table and wore his hand-me-downs. 
He says, this son of yours. Didn't you see him as a family member? Who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, that is, prostitutes. You killed the fatted calf for him. Think about that mindset. Instead of being compassionate, instead of showing pity and saying, man, my brother was lost. And look at the great love my father is showing him. This is awesome. He's saying, not only did he waste your money, he himself is an absolute waste. I am not partying with you in rejoicing over him. And there are some in the church that might think, you know what, that person is too bad to be saved. Let's treat them differently because they sin differently. Be careful with that. And we could be very tempted to do that, especially in this culture with the homosexuality movement. God hates all sin, but God loves every sinner. And if we start acting high horse-ish, then you will act just like the older brother. I will not treat a transvestite no different than I would treat a man who's watching porn in this fellowship. They both need to repent and they both need Jesus. I will not put one above the other, my dear friends. We all need to repent of pride, of greed, of self-praise, of self-love. Oh, my dear friends, we are always being cleansed of our sin. Why not bring another one who needs the same work and welcome them until they repent? If they finally decide, I don't want Jesus, then you can say, Go on your merry way, because Jesus calls men lovingly to repent and trust in him for salvation. 31, and he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. He gave him two-thirds of the property and possessions. Yet the older son's acting like he has nothing, yet he has everything. He has the father with him. Again, that's a picture of the Pharisees. They had more knowledge, or they could have had more knowledge of the father because they had the scriptures, and the tax collectors and sinners did not. You have to understand that the scribes and the Pharisees understood this, these parables perfectly. 32. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. He says, it's the right thing to do to rejoice over your brother's salvation. It is the right thing to do. What happened when the shepherd found that one lost sheep who needed Jesus because the others quote unquote, didn't need Jesus. He said to his friends, rejoice with me. And then when the woman found that coin, she told her friends, rejoice with me. And now we have the father who had a son who was lost, hopeless, dead and gone. He's looking to the older son and saying, son, rejoice with me. When was the last time we rejoiced over the power and the saving work of God? When? In reality, let's get to it. Let's rejoice over the mercy, over the compassion, over the saving power of our awesome God. And so then, in closing, what brings the Father great joy? I'll tell you, it's one sinner who repents. One sinner. Which means <laughs> that the angels are partying all the time. Always rejoicing. Why? Because people are coming to the Lord one person at a time. Because the gate is narrow and so is the road. One person at a time. The gate refers to justification, believing by faith. The narrow path refers to sanctification, the life of the Christian. If you don't have sanctification, ongoing cleansing from sin, you've never even entered the narrow path. The end of that narrow road, glory. And we find in the New Testament that we are going to be a part of the wedding supper of the Lamb. Just like this party here, we're actually going to sit with our Lord, our big brother, our Father in heaven. How good is our God? 
he rejoices over one lost sinner. We can say, what is it that makes God happy? Salvation makes God happy. Salvation. When you came to Jesus, God rejoiced in heaven.